Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit again about the difference between classical and romantic, just because that's not a real, real easy idea, and also because um, it's really one of the central uh, divides in Western music. Even today, when you go to the concert hall, you hear usually either classical or romantic music, some 20th century, 21st century. Um, not as much, strangely enough. Um, so, I'll repeat some things that you've heard before. Bear with me. And I'd like to talk a little bit, I want to take you one step further and talk a little bit about classical and romantic harmony. That's not easy. Um, uh, so we'll just, uh, if you find that that's a little overwhelming, that's okay. Just let it go. But if you do catch on and you can set, make, make some sense of it, that's great. It's just one more layer that you're able to work with. Uh, so, okay, once again, whoops. You raised some of that stuff from me. We said that the classical style in theory, in philosophy, is a balance between nature, or actually, let's put it this way, is based on the idea of nature, and nature is a harmony, is a simultaneous um, presence of the physical world, said the classicists, and the spiritual something we cannot see, right? Um, and so for music, that translates into an art form which is designed to make us sense this, to feel this, to see what is important, what is meaningful, what is, what is essential in life, is, um, turns into a balance between, let us say, a number of things, but um, a logical symmetry, That is four bars plus four bars. We spoke of one and two and a, a three and a four. Although technically those are four bar measures and I'm cutting them in half, but don't worry. It comes out the same. So this is sort of logical. On the other hand, these bars are emotional. They have a rise and a fall. The melody creates a sense of emotional expression. That balance between the logical and the emotional is one classical balance. Another one is what we call conventional. Conventional are the conventions that are defined and that everybody uses. Um, for example, a four-bar phrase is a convention. It's something that Haydn used. It's something that Mozart used. It's something that John Lennon used. Um, it's, it's that conventional. Uh, what is not conventional is called individual or you could call it invention if you want. Convention and invention or individual. versus generic means more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the melody, for example, of any classical phrase is individual. It's the only time that melody was ever used or ever will be used unless it's quoted by somebody, another composer or something like that. So that balance between the conventional and the individual is the classical style. Okay? Um, now, there's also, as we look at the broader scheme of a, of a composition, for example, the sonata allegro form, there's also the sense in which that first part of the sonata allegro form, the exposition, right, is much more conventional than the second form, part, which is called the development. Why? Well, in the classical age, it was assumed not didn't always happen this way, but it was more or less assumed that the exposition would be presented as one melody, usually starting with the orchestra and then picked up by the soloist if it's a concerto. If it's a symphony, it's just the orchestra. Um, and then handed off, passed off to the soloist or the orchestra, depending which direction we're going, and they would simply repeat it. And these conventional forms were pretty much understood to be universal. That's conventional. And usually there were two themes in the classical age. In the romantic age, this started to expand because we remember that the romanticism was trying to create something outside the box, right, so to speak. Okay, and then the development stage was free. 
um, the composer did whatever came to mind without concern for how it goes, so to speak. They, then, uh, to contain this development section, so that this freedom feels contained within a form, we have the recapitulation, which is almost a literal repetition of the exposition. There's a tonal, a, a harmonic difference that brings it a little bit more final. Uh, uh, we don't need to get into the details. And then just a little cap at the end, which is called a coda, just sort of a sum up, uh, usually in the classical age, fairly quickly. Okay, so that's the classical style. What does the romantic style do? It tries to get into the spiritual realm. And now we saw that with our eyes in that in that painting, and I, I, I really was impressed with the discussion on the discussion board. That was really cool. Um, some of, uh, everybody got a sense of the spookiness, of the, the, the eeriness, even the supernatural kind of connotations of that painting by Cusper David Friedrich, Ab Abbey Graveyard in Snow. And that sense of, I'm looking at something, but I'm sensing something else, right? That's really the classic, the, the romantic, um, the Romantic Age. Um, they're longing for something that you can't see. They're longing for something beyond nature. And it starts out with the idea that nature doesn't give us this satisfying sense of, uh, of spirituality anymore. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for that of thought, and it goes back to uh, some philosophy out of the University of Vienna and blah, blah, blah. But we don't need to go into that. So this longing for the infinite, you know, longing for something that you can't have. When we talk about romantic in common English, we usually think of love. Um, that's really not what the German romantic, romanticists were initially thinking about. It was part of it. But the kind of love they were most fascinated by, strangely enough, was unrequited love because it's a sense of longing for something that's not really possible, right? So it becomes, and if you've, you know, if you've been 14 and helplessly in love with somebody that doesn't know you exist, and you know what that feels like. But it also becomes almost spiritual, you know, that this, this heightening of your awareness of this every time she gets within, you know, a mile, you, you know, et cetera. You know, so. so that kind of longing, that kind of sense of this world doesn't give me what I need, and I, and I know it's out there somewhere. Exactly where the song, by the way, we started this class with, Over the Rainbow, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, that idea um, that you can go over the rainbow, why can't I? Well, you can't, right? But you can sense it, you can feel it, and of course, in the dream, and the dreams became a romantic thing too, and not only in, in literature, but also music. We're gonna see one in a couple weeks. So that is, becomes the essence of romanticism. Does this make sense? So far so good? Okay, so, and what happens in the, so let's say the Sonata Allegro form, we've also discovered that with Beethoven. Now, Camin puts Beethoven in the classical age, and a lot of people think of him as a classical composer, but my argument is what he's doing in that fifth symphony is pretty romantic in the sense that at the very beginning, he doesn't give us a four-bar phrase at all. He gives us, and one more time, I'll give it to you, uh, basically. Well, what's that, right? It's basic, it's a fragment. It's a, what, they, what technically it's called a motif. But that's not a classical conventional form at all. It's just this little germinal thing that then grows and and starts growing like something out of the aliens movies. Right? Um, that's, not the, that's not the proper term. So, okay, so we'll, now, that's basically a sum up of what we've done so far. Um, bringing in the Beethoven Fifth Symphony and the, and the Cusper David Friedrich painting as two examples of arguably romanticism, arguably with Beethoven. Um, and and uh, and now I'd like to try and show you, and here's where I again ask your indulgence. How far, how, uh, how far are we? Uh, how much time have we um, recorded so far? Is there a the, timer on here? Maybe about ten minutes. Right? Ten I think we're good. I think uh, yeah, the YouTube uploads are good for about fifteen minutes, and then they get complicated. I guess. So, so we, I can move a little bit farther. So I want to show you. Um, so we said that classical harmony comes out of <clears throat> comes out of nature. I'm not going to play the instrument. I'll do maybe do that another time. But I want to show you what that means. 
And um, we talked a little bit about this in class last time, but we didn't, uh, for the p people at home, we haven't done it, and I didn't have the cello along. So um, whenever you hear any note, let's just take one for example. Is that, uh, can you tell if there's a, oh, there's not a, uh, it's, not, I'm, it's probably picking it up, I would think that's not enough. Mm. Now, you're hearing that note, obviously, that's a C. Um, what you're also hearing unconsciously are a number of notes above it. These are called overtones. And whenever you hear an instrumental sound or a vocal sound, you're hearing the note that you think you're hearing, but you're also hearing notes vibrating above it, and your ear picks them up unconsciously without realizing it. And I'm going to show you how you can make yourself hear them. And the, those people who play guitar know how to do this, or cello for that matter. But if, um, and the way this is happening, I just want to show you, before I demonstrate what I'm going to do with this cello, I want to show you once again the theory. So when I pluck that string, the string is vibrating. Let's say this is the string from here to here. The string is obviously vibrating like this. I don't know if it's obvious. But the string swings this way, and then it swings this way, and it swings this way, obviously. As a whole string, in other words. And that produces the sound, the fundamental tone that you hear, that mm, that we were listening to a moment ago. The thing is, and this is the magic of the, of the harmony, is that the string, strangely enough, is also vibrating like this. In other words, when I pluck it, half the string goes like this, and the other half the string goes like this. So while the whole string is going like this, at the same time, it's going like this. And that produces another sound. And that sound is exactly an octave above the original. So you're hearing it, you're, without hearing it, you're hearing it, so to speak, right? It's there, it's part of the sound that you're hearing. It creates a kind of um, unconscious awareness or, um, of another richness inside the, this, on this, this note that I just played. Now, the next thing is, and this is, this is really quite amazing, I can never quite get over this, it is also vibrating in thirds. So while it's going like this and like this, it's also going, I don't have enough hands for this, I need some help. You know, it's going like, the top two are going this and the other half is going like this, so it's vibrating in thirds. And that produces this note. So this was the whole string, this is the half string, and this is that next one, the thirds. And you're hearing that note. Now, as you can imagine, it's also vibrating in fourths. I don't have to put it up on the board, I'm not sure why it came up again. You can't see it anymore after, anyway, it's a scribble. So, if it, the, the, so this is the whole string, this is the half string, this is the third, this is the fourth, and then the fifth, it's vibrating in fifths, which creates this note, and sixths, which creates this note. And lo and behold, if you take these three notes, not this one, not this one, not this one, but these three, you get what's called the triad. Right? You've heard that before. So lower, right? Just those notes. So in other words, the basic building blocks of Western music, that triad, or this, we'll talk about this fifth later on, this is called a fifth, the third one. This is an octave because it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five steps above that, one, two, three, four, five. And above that is the, the, the octave again. And then it's one, three, five. One, three, and five. Does that make sense? So one, three, and five. Basically, the building blocks of everything from the beginning of Mozart's Piano Concerto number one, uh, number twenty, to um, Let It Be, 
right? Um, that's, th those are built on triads, and that's basically the, the classical style. There's a major triad that goes, it sounds like this, you don't have to remember this, but that's how it sounds like. It comes right out of the overtone series of any given note. And then there's a minor triad which comes from stealing a note a little higher on the. If you keep going up that overtone series, the amazing thing is that eventually you hear all of the notes on the piano. They're all up there. I didn't hit the right ones uh, exactly, but if you take them all, put them down here, you've got the keyboard. Out of any one given note, right? Now, some little adjustments happened in the meantime over the years, but that's... that's not. So, in other words, the point I'm trying to make is that classical harmony, these triads, this that basic structure of classical harmony comes from nature because it comes from the physics of sound. And that's the nature that classicism <coughs> was built on in harmony. So when um, Mozart starts his piano concerto, la -di -da -da -di -da 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 he's basically playing those basic notes that come out of the overtone series from the basic sound, the basic note of that, the key note of that piece. Um, it gets more complicated, but that's basically the idea. Now, what does Romanticism do? Romanticism tries to escape that hierarchy of sound, tries to, to draw us out of the natural sounds that we hear from physics. Instead of this, we might get, I'm just going to make something up here, tones that come, I mean, they would be there eventually up there, but those are not tones that are in your ear from the harmonies of a basic overtone series, right? They come from, from, from farther away, and they make us feel more, even the minor scale, minor chord, make us feel more longing, right? And if you make, if you draw, make, let's say, make it even more romantic, if you take this note, this, which is one, two, three, four, five, and bring it down a half step, that creates, or even more so, right, what's called a diminished chord, is one of the favorite of the Romanticists because it's got so much tension in it. Now, there are physical reasons for that that also have to do with physics. We don't have to get into that. The basic idea is that romantic harmonies come from things that are sort of ill-defined. So any of those chords where you feel kind of, it doesn't sound like this, right? which is really a home base. Right? And so when we get into romantic harmonies, we, we try to avoid the obvious. We try to avoid the defined. Oh, whoops. Right? That's, a, that's a chord that's built out of the harmonies that come to us immediately from that cello string, so to speak. If I want to create a romantic harmony, I'm going to try to avoid those, and I'll go to something. Something like that, right? And jazz will use that all the time, right? Right, this major seventh chord, which is used a lot in jazz, even at the end, instead of going leaves us hanging, right, unresolved, as if, okay, we want to go up there. That would be the classical resolution. The romantic resolution, to make a long story short, would be, right, and you can get, you know, oh, that's got its own kind of restless beauty, right, and that restless beauty, that longing for that girl that you couldn't have, um, from my perspective, is, is what the romanticists were after. And so um, that's basically romantic harmony. Let's, um, oh, one more step before we turn on. And I mentioned Chopin is one of the people you can listen to for this week, week seven. He starts one of his pieces like this. What's that? It 
doesn't sound like a melody. Right? It doesn't sound like a classical harmony. We can't even tell what key we're in, really. But um, but it and it you couldn't you could never figure out you couldn't even count the measures really. I mean, are there two four bar phrases? <laughs> thing is that this isn't one, two, three, it's two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and then two. I forget how it goes. Um, so it's a strange kind of lack of form, formal convention, lack of roundness, lack of the, the conventional symmetry that we're used to in the classical form. Chopin tries to get away from that, and he tries to get away from that clearly defined sense of, I mean, if you wanted to do it this way, it would be A major, and it's very clear where, what chord we're in. That's kind of a classical sense of roundness, at least harmonically, right? And it says, okay, that we know where our home base is. And Chopin says, no, we don't really know where our home base is. We don't know what home is. You can look at his personal life. That kind of made sense for a lot of these guys, actually. They're very often their philosophy fit their personal lives. Okay, let's take a, a short break now with the, um, with the recording.